Junoop. It is my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome. And pleasure. thank you, first and foremost. Uh, thank you for not only sharing your wisdom and expertise with the audience today, but from my perspective, thank you for the work that you're doing so diligently in ensuring this new career accelerator um, meets the needs of learners and industry uh, as, as well as academia. You're doing an amazing job. So uh, we're very lucky to, to be learning off you, as is the audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. It's been an honour and a pleasure. Brilliant. I'll hand over to you now. Um, and just a reminder for everyone, if there's any course-related questions, I'll answer them later. Use the Q&A function and, um, and introduce yourself on the chat if you choose to do so. Over to you, Chinook. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So quickly to introduce myself, um, my name is Shanoop, and I'm the subject lead for data at Fortref. I have been a data scientist for several years now, designing and building custom analytic solutions for large companies, as well as playing an equally active role as an AI and data science educator. So with that, um, I think we can get started with today's topic. Let me quickly share my screen. Yeah, can, can you see my screen? The... Yeah? Okay, so let's get started. So today's topic will center around machine learning. And we're going to get a peek into what really happens behind the scenes. Gradient descent, the backbone of machine learning, will be looked at under a microscope. So with that said, let's get started. First of all, let's um, tackle a few of the basic concepts before we get into the more um, nitty gritties of it. What is machine learning? Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And the key aspect of machine learning is that it involves feeding data into algorithms. And there's, there's a multitude of algorithms out there. So we feed the data into the algorithms and ask the algorithms to learn from this data. What does it have to learn? There are certain relationships and patterns hidden within this data. So we are asking the algor algorithms to go figure out those relationships and patterns. And once you do that, we are going to put you to good use. So that's what machine learning is all about. There are three machine learning paradigms. Um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Today, we will especially focus on supervised learning. What is supervised learning? It is a type of machine learning where the algorithm is trained on a labeled data set. What is a labeled data set? A labeled data set comprises of training examples. It could be hundreds of examples, thousands. Today, it's even millions of examples. And each example will comprise of certain input features and a corresponding output value. So to give you an example, let's talk about housing prices, right? So you have uh, the input features are the number of rooms, the square feet of the house, how many floors does it have? Does it have a parking? All of those would be the input features. And based on, these are the independent variables, we call it, because Based on these independent variables, we are now able to understand the relationship that these features have with the price of the house. So if you have three floors, 4,000 square feet, six bedrooms, then this is the price of the house. Another combination would be two floors, 2,000 square feet, and so on. It's a different price of the house. So these are your training examples. And using these training examples, we need to understand what is the relationship that these input features they have with the target variable in this example, which is the price of the house. Now, linear regression is the simplest model of all time. What does it do? It very simply models a relationship between the dependent variable, in our example, it was the price of the house, with all of the other independent variables, which was in our example, the square feet, the number of rooms, all of it. 
And it's a simple linear relationship that it tries to model. Now, this is where we are going to take a slight deviation from the normal way of doing linear regression. We are going to understand linear regression through the lens of machine learning. To be able to dissect this title, we need to understand a few more things. Let's, under, let's look at what those are. Now, linear regression arguably is the most widely used predictive tool in existence today. As simple as it is, it is still the most widely used because of its simplicity and because of how uh, explainable the model is. Now, it is when I say that it is the most widely used, it is the most widely used as a purely statistical model. And I'll get to that in a minute. Now, today's session is going to be, how can we use linear regression as a machine learning model, which is very different in the approach that it takes when you compare it with the statistical approach that is very widely used. But once we understand linear regression as a machine learning model, there's no going back. Our life has changed forever because linear regression as a machine learning model forms the foundation for the most advanced machine learning models in existence today. That's how important it becomes and it becomes a cornerstone for the most advanced algorithms in existence today. So it is important to understand the, the nuts and bolts of how linear regression can be used as a machine learning model, which is what we're going to focus on today. So I mentioned there's two ways that linear regression has been used or can be used. One is the statistical approach, wherein you have all of these relationships or the training data which, 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 which will tell us what these relationships are or which gives us an indication of what the relationships are between the independent variables and the dependent or the target variable. So in the statistical approach, in one shot, it will look at all of this data and it will come up with the equation of a line that will suitably um, uh, represent the relationships between the dependent and the independent variables. Done in one shot. That is the statistical approach. Now, the machine learning approach is very different. If there's no one shot um, uh, reaching to the answer, it has to take a learning approach, which is an iterative approach. And that sets the stage for us to get into linear regression as a machine learning tool. So first of all, let's understand what's a line because it's a line that we are trying to find, a line that will fit through the data. So a line is characterized by just two things. It has a slope, which is the angle of this line, and it has an intercept, which is where exactly is this line positioned? Is it here? Is it there? Is it there? So angle and its intercept, we call it, meaning where is it positioned? Two things. We understand these two things about the line. We know the line in its entirety. So now let's, let's look at the problem, how we start out. We are given a data set. As I mentioned, these are the, the X's. We generally call it X's. The X's are the input features and Y is the target variable. So in our housing example, X1 is the number of floors, X2 is the square feet, X3 is uh, uh, whether there's a parking available, and so on and so forth, and Y is the price of the house. It's as simple as that. This, and you have multitudes of these. So this is our training examples. Today, it runs into millions of rows of data. And what, what are we trying to do here? So we will first plot all of these data the input and the output. And then we try to fit a line through the center of these points. Once we are able to fit a line, how does this help us? So this is where linear regression becomes a predictive tool. Once we found this line that, that roughly passes through the center of all of these points, now we are in a position to say, now give me a whole new set of input features, the values, and I'll tell you what the price of the house should be. I've already learned based on all of the training samples that you gave me. I've learned what it should be. Now you can throw anything at me and I can predict what the price of the house should be. This is machine learning. Now, how do we get started with machine learning? 
there are four things that are essentially required. First of all, we need data. We just saw the data. Uh, it's given to us. We need to use it for our learning. Second, we need to decide on a model. So this is in general, not necessarily linear regression. This is how we do machine learning. And there can be any number of models that can be chosen for this purpose. So when you look at machine learning, once first, first thing is you need the data because that's what you learn from. Second, you need to select a model, linear regression, decision trees, these are all models, right? So in our case, we're going to select the simplest one, which is linear regression model. Now, this, the third and the fourth point is what makes it a machine learning process. So there are two things we need for the machine to learn. We have the data, we have the model. That's not enough. We need to help the model on its way. We need to give some guidance to the model as it is learning. How do we do that? We do it with two things. One is the, the most important thing, which is the objective function or cost. What is cost? Let's take a look at that. Cost basically tells us what is the error between the predicted value and the actual value. So how do we start out this process? We have a whole set of data points. We need to fit a line to we are going to start out with guess value of a line, meaning I don't know what the line should be. I don't know how where the center of those data points are. I'm just going to just, just put a line somewhere, right? It's, it's a bad line. It's a wrong line. It does not uh, optimally define the relationship between the input and the output features or accept it. But this is the process that we will start out with. We'll start with a random line. And then we'll see if I, if I now, now that I have the equation of a line, I can give the input values to this equation of the line. It will tell me the output value. That is my predicted value. So I have a predicted value. And for each combination of input, I have a predicted value and I have a, an actual value that is sitting in my training data set. I'm going to compare the two. And that will tell me what is the error between my predicted value and the actual value. This will be my guiding light during this training process. This will tell me, you know, your error is bad. We need to do something about this line because this line is not a good line. We need to change this line. The angle has to be changed. The intercept has to be changed. Something has to be changed because this cost or this error is not acceptable. And this is where gradient descent, the learning algorithm kicks in. It will say, okay, you have told me what is the cost or the error. Now, using this error, I'm going to update your W and B, meaning your slope and the intercept, which will give us a new line. Now go check your error again. Come back to me. Is it better? If it's better, and if it, is, it, is it perfect? No, it's better, but it's not perfect. Okay, we'll go through this process again. So this is what gradient descent does. It is guided by the cost, and it will keep updating the parameters of the line till we arrive at a cost or an error that is acceptable. That is when we say that the learning is completed. So this is what gradient descent does. Give me the cost. I have a technique by which using that cost value, I will do something to your W and B, which is your slope and intercept, and I'll give you a new line. Go use that line, come back and tell me if it, is, if it has made it better or worse. If it is worse, well, I'm sorry about it, I'll correct it. If it is better, well, and it is still not up to the mark, but it is getting better, well, then I know what to do with it as well. So trust me on this, but give me, keep feeding me this error. And we need to keep doing this hundreds of times, thousands of times, till we reach that minimum error. This is gradient descent. This is machine learning. So essentially, we have these data points. We need to fit uh, a line through the center of these data points. R squared, once we're done with it, R squared, which we are all aware of, will tell us how good was that fit. And once we have identified that, that we found the line of best fit, then we can move in and use that equation of the line to predict for a new set of inputs. Again. Okay. Now we're getting into the nuts and bolts of it. What happens when you change W and B? So as I mentioned, uh, that the, these are the two parameters of the line. If you change the W, the slope of the line or the angle of the line changes. If you change B, the line moves up or down. 
without changing the angle, the line just moves up or down. And these are the two parameters that gradient descent is continuously changing in each iteration to be able to reduce the cost because there's nothing more to the line. It's just these two things that it has to play with. So just a quick recap. What is machine learning? How are, what are the fundamental steps involved? Start with a random line. You need to start somewhere, right? Start with a random line. It's, a, it's going to be a bad line. It's the error is going to go through the roof. No problem. Trust gradient descent. It will bring us back to earth. So start with a random line. It will lead to an error between the actual value and the predicted value. And our aim is to minimize this error that leave it to gradient descent, it will take care of it. So these are the errors. Once you have the line, that is for each value of the input, the line says that this is the value, but the actual value is this. This is the error that we have. And this error is what we need to feed to gradient descent for it to make the adjustments to W and B. So basically what is happening is, this is the error, this is the weight value or uh, the slope of the line. So as the slope is changed, we'll see that from a high error value, it is slowly learning, learning, coming down, coming down, coming down, and it reaches the minimum error. At this point, we can say that the model has finished its learning. And from here on, the magic starts. So in a nutshell, you have error or cost. It's a difference between the predicted and actual values. It is essential. And uh, once we have that, then leave it to gradient descent to do the learning part. Now I want to show you all of this in action. So let me just stop the sharing for a second. Now I'm going to show you some of these things happening in real time. Okay, so here I have a set of data points and I have the option using the slider, I can change the, uh, the parameters of the line. So as I change the W, the slope of the line starts changing. As I change B, the line moves up or down without the slope changing. So essentially what we're doing here, so this is, this is not machine learning, this is human learning, right? I am looking at it, visually inspecting it, and then I'm making changes. Am I at the center? 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 No, I'm moving further away. Come back, come back, come back, come back. Okay, am I there? Maybe I need to adjust this, move it a little above. So this is my visual uh, understanding of what is going on. And then I am modifying the parameters. Great, but um, this worked because this was a simple model with just one input feature. Today we have, uh, data sets with 50 and 100 input features. How do we manage it? And first of all, how do I move, uh, uh, modify all of these simultaneously while also looking at the line in 50 dimensions? Can I see the line in 50 dimensions? No, right? So while this was a good exercise, no doubt, um, to understand what uh, the task that machine learning is asked to do, um, let us accept that this is a very tedious task for a human to do. We could have done it if we had some, some, some help uh, to, first of all, see the line in 50 dimensions, first of all. Uh, I don't think that's possible. So fairly speaking, um, do you think this is an impossible task, maybe? Yes, it is. It is an impossible task for a human being to do. This is this is what it is. It's as simple as this, but and yet the the size and the dimensions of the data set will not allow us to be able to do it manually. So the verdict is out. We need a much more sophisticated technique to help us. Even though we know how to do it, we cannot as humans be able to do it. So can someone come in and help us with a more sophisticated, but the operative word being automated technique, meaning no human is going to step in. You will have to somehow learn. And again, look at how, how much of a challenge this is because the human was doing it with visual inspection. 
how is uh, a, 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 an automated method going to do this? There comes your error function, the error, the cost, the guiding light for gradient descent, and let's see how it does this magic. So hold on, this is going to be life-changing. There you go. I've opened another notebook here and I'm going to run through this notebook. So first of all, we have the data and everything is made ready. And I'm going to run the notebook as we speak. And there you go. Gradient descent just happened. You know, in a split second, the machine learning just happened. You, you blinked and you missed, but that's okay. I have captured it um, in video. And we're going to see how this thing actually did this magic. The learning is over, right? So let's understand a little bit about what that learning was. So cost is the uh, the more technical term for error. It's it's error, but we call it cost. We like to make it, um, you know, a little. Um, uh, we don't want to go with easy terms that are easily understandable. So this is just a general thing that you will get to see in machine learning when you see these terminologies. So we will use cost. So it's basically the error. So we started with a random line and um, we looked at how different was the predicted value from the actual value. We found it was very bad. Even this number is very small in real data sets. You will see this number going into millions. So it was bad. So now gradient descent comes in and says, that's okay, it was bad, but just tell me this number and let me go change the value of W and V and come back to you. Now tell me what's the new error. So it went and did that, came back, and now the error is reduced. The error is reducing, reducing, reducing. It's going on doing this. And we did close to 1,200 iterations, right? 1,200 times the value of W and V was changed. And every time we went back to gradient descent and said, now what is the error? Now what is the error? And gradient descent used just that single thing to adjust itself. So this has happened. Now let's look at what has been captured in video. Hold on. There you see. So this is, the first graph is showing the weight value changing. The second graph is showing the bias value or the B value changing, the intercept value. And while this is changing and moving towards the minimum, look at what is happening to the line. Let me run this again. Oh, sorry. First, let me stop this. Then let me run this again. See, the initial line was very far away because it was a guess value. But now look what gradient descent is doing. We are not playing any part here. It has adjusted itself, adjusted itself, made rapid strides, and then once it got closer towards the points, now it's doing fine tuning. That's why you don't see a rapid movement, it's fine adjustments. You can see here, it is still changing. So this means that something is still going on. If you missed it, don't worry, it's still here. So start from a very random value, and very quickly it's moving, making rapid strides, rapid strides, rapid strides came very close to the points. Now it won't make rapid strides, it will make small strides. Adjustment, adjustment, fine tuning, right? And when does it stop? When we have reached this point, this is the error. This is the minimum error that we are after. This is our goal. And once we reach that minimum error, we are done and magically look at what happened. The line found its way to the center of the data points. So that is the relationship between that minimum error and the position of the line. When it's minimum error, rest assured, the line has centered itself around those points. And this is what machine learning does. But now, hold on, I have an even cooler video where we're going to see all of this in 3D. So here you see the weight changing, it's in a 2D uh, graph. Here you can see the intercept changing, again a 2D graph. Now let's put all of this together into a 3D graph and see what happens. There you go. Start from a random place, 
move. So here we are having weight and bias changing simultaneously, and it is getting represented in a 3D graph. So look here, it has changed direction. Why? It is in a hurry to reach the minimum point. So what gradient descent does, it finds at every point, at every iteration, it stops, looks around, tell me which is the fastest way to reach the minimum. So when it came here, it had a choice. It could have kept continuing like this, or if it took a, a detour, if it took a change in direction, it understood that it will reach the minimum faster. So it's in a hurry, which is good for us. Otherwise, we could have waited forever and ever. Now, this is the magic of gradient descent. It will, at every iteration, it will look around and try to find the direction of steepest descent towards the minimum error. And that is exactly what we see happening. So it starts from a random place, random place. Now it's moving, it's moving, it's moving, it's moving. And as it's moving and it takes comes here and it takes a rapid step, now from that point, look at how fast the line is now beginning to converge towards these points. So that was important. That direction change was really important because it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, taking a casual stroll in the park. And at this point, it realized, you know what, we need to, we need to pick up our pace here. And it changed its direction of movement. And very, and correspondingly, we see that the line also from that point onwards, it woke up and now it's making rapid movement towards these data points. Let's see that again in case you missed it. Slow, steady, okay, walk in the park, walk in the park. So it's a light stroll and, and now look what happens. Hey, wake up. Let's pull up our socks. Let's uh, get uh, things moving. And again, it, it got things moving, but here now it's slowly moving again. These rapid strides are over because now it's in the process of fine adjustment, fine tuning, because now we are roughly there. Rapid movement will take us away from these points and so now move slowly. So even that information, gradient descent has it, right? Hey, you're very close. Now don't fool around and get bounced around too much. So make fine adjustments, right? So this is the whole process. There are, there are rapid strides. There will be a period where um, you know, things are just moving at a gradual pace. There will come a time when there is a rapid step taken. And again, there will come a time when things are at in a, a, a moving in a very slow pace. So all of this is determined by the error and the, the quest for gradient descent to to get us to the minimum cost as fast as possible, but also not 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 really get carried away and uh, you know lose its direction. So all of it is managed by this magical algorithm gradient descent by just looking at this error, and by using the error, it is just modifying the parameters of the line, and you just saw the magic happen right in front of you. We never played a part in this. And it did everything by itself. And now that we have reached here, the center of these points, we have an equation of the line. And now you can feed it any new set of inputs and it will now predict the output for you. So what you witnessed today, this whole process, is what we famously call as machine learning. Thank you. Fantastic. And thank you, Shunu, for taking us through that journey. It was quite fascinating. Um, and just a reminder for anyone, uh, if they would like to pop any questions of Shunu into the Q&A function, of which Jerome has done so, if I can pose this question to you, Shunu, on behalf of Jerome. Um, great way to understand this. Well done. Is the gradient descent prioritising one cost metric over the other? or assessing MSA and R2 together? So gradient descent will be guided by 
one cost function at a time. So depending on the nature of the problem, you have to first, just like you decided the model, equally, you have to decide the cost function also. So the model has to be a single model. The cost function also has to be chosen by us. And once those two are available, then gradient descent does its work. So it will be, it will be guided by a single cost function. You can look at other cost functions, but the gradient descent will take only one at a time for its learning process. Does that, does that answer your question? Jerome, uh, feel free to pop that uh, in, in the Q&A function there. Thank you, I believe it does. Um, from my perspective, I've got a question, Chanuk. Um, in what industry requires of today uh, in data scientists, the visualization that you, you showed, but then taking that further into the business application of, of data science and the visualization, how important is that, do you feel? Um, and, and how much weight bearing do employers put towards the impact of the visualization for, for, for rapid business decision making, for example? So the visualization that I showed here um, versus the visualization that you're talking about, uh, I would say, DC, the, they are two different things. Now, visualization, we, we all accept and understand, and especially for businesses that do not understand all of these mathematical uh, terms and terminologies. It's the it's the visual representation that will that will give them an idea of what all of this was and how useful it was, and most importantly, how useful it is for the business, right? So that's 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 a given. Visualization is how we need to present data to business stakeholders. Now, the problem that we see also in the industry is that data scientists or people who come out as data scientists from these courses they don't understand the nuts and bolts of what is actually happening behind the scenes of the mathematical equation and machine learning and gradient descent. All of these are the cornerstone and something that they use on a daily basis. And yet there is a complete lack of understanding of what is really happening. So um, many of these courses bring you out with the knowledge of how to press those buttons, sit back and see if it comes out right, if it didn't come out right, no problem, press the button again, right? So that is not what we want to leave our learners with. If you're pressing the button, you should know what's happening when you press the button. And before you press the button again, you should be able to go back and see what really happened. And if there's, a, if there's something else that you need to change without just keeping on pressing the button, this visualization will help you understand. Or these kinds of visualizations that tell you what is the actual technical process that is happening. It leaves you a much more informed and knowledgeable data scientist. Wonderful. Jerome has, has responded as well so and said thank you. Um, but MSE got the prior, was prioritized in that case. Yes, of course. So this is a linear regression problem. MSC is uh, uh, perfectly fits for us. Um, so we have used the MSC cost function or the error function in this particular case. Now, if it is a classification problem, I would be using uh, a binary cross entropy or a, or a categorical cross entropy loss function. So it's horses for courses, and we have a, 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 a collection of these uh, error functions or cost functions that we can put to use. In this case, you're right, it is the MSC. Wonderful. Before I move on to Ant's um, answer anyone's questions regarding the course. Um, I thought I'd ask you about the course, Chanuk, having your input into um, so much of the design and working, bridging that gap between academia and industry as you do. Um, what do you feel that sets this, this program apart from a not only just the technical standpoint, but within the quadrant of learning that we've developed, what sets the, the, this program apart for aspiring or progressing data scientists? So, so number one, as I mentioned, of course, there's a unique collection of topics that we put together, um, having gone through an extensive research phase, interviewing um, industry leaders and especially data leaders. And we understood their pain points and use that as input towards the design of the program. So that's the first differentiating factor. The second one, we understood that 
there's no business thinking or relevance um, that that comes to the forefront when we take up any data science problem. So again, that's the second thing that we try to uh, emphasize throughout this program, right? Well, it's great that you have your neural networks and your map and stats and all of it, but at the end of the day, if you're not solving a problem and essentially it's going to be a business problem, right? Then um, all of this is merely just uh, academic, right? Mm -hmm. So our job is to put this into action and help businesses. So that business relevance is something that we stress. The third one, there's more, there's a lot of doing that we have kept in this program, right? So of course we will, we will show you some of these inner details, the nuts and bolts, but we'll also give you an opportunity to practice the application of many of these. And most importantly, most importantly, I would say that there is, we have an amazing um, industry grade um, employer partner um, project that comes towards the end of the program. It's not just the end of the program project. We have several projects of varying sizes throughout the program, but it is all culminating in a very big project where the data set, the, the, the context, and every aspect of that project is, is, uh, is coordinated and supervised by uh, a very large entity, a company, uh, it could be even a government entity. So we have tied up with uh, several big names. So they will provide it. And we are actually solving a real problem. And it is the application of all of these concepts that we will get. We will get the opportunity to apply it while we do this um, employer partner project. But this is also going to be evaluated by the employer because they need it for solving an actual business problem. So these are some of the things that uh, creates that differentiating factor for this program. That's fantastic. I think, um, Shanoop, if ever you are considering a career change, we would love you as an enrollment advisor because you articulated that so well. Thank you ever so kindly. That, and I'll, I'll touch a little deeper on the on the industry project if if the audience would like. Please get your questions coming through regarding the program. You you met, you articulated that so well, Shanu. The practical application of learning in a real world setting, um, with and I'm, we, we're happy to announce that there's there's three partners. There's Bank of England, um, there's SAS, and Pure Gym, Europe's largest gymnasium chain, who are looking at a very commercially minded model. Bank of England are providing both privately held and publicly held data sets with the challenge that they're looking to to assist or have have learners assist with. But the practical uh, application... On, on that, on that uh, point, uh, DC, um, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to reveal those yes. names, but, but you did it. So it's out in the open now. <laughs> exactly. We're really, really so pleased to have such esteemed industry partners and employer partners where learners will actually immerse themselves in that real um, project and scenario that they present. And how that's structured for the for the audience's benefit is that there is, you'll be grouped in teams of five or six learners, um, which is reflective of, of industry as well. If, if we were to take two or 300 learners at an intake and there's a group of 20, one's tasks and responsibilities within that team get, get diluted too much, we feel. Um, you'll be presented with that scenario or challenge with the industry partner and work over a period as a team to come up with innovative, tangible um, solutions, presenting your recommendations back to the client in a consultancy style presentation. The benefits for the learner are, are, are more than even just the practical application of learning we find from the career accelerators we've been running with, with other university partners for quite some time now, where it's an amazing opportunity to be networking with other high caliber learners. And there's true value in the peer network and the peer support that comes with that in a team environment, but also networking with senior leaders within industry. And lastly, when one is explaining their experience levels, or if one is asked in an interview, when you're going for a dream, dream job, how was your experience at Cambridge in that data science program to actually articulate that practical experience is a true demonstration of one's value to an employer, much more so than a, an exam result could ever be, for example. 
we feel. Um, so there is multiple layers of benefit to that and networking, um, the practical application and certainly the storytelling that, that comes from that experience is invaluable. If I can, before I give an overview and let you go, I know you've got a lot on. Um, if I can take it back a step though, I mentioned no exams. Um, how, are, how are learners assessed throughout the four courses leading up to the employer project, Chinook? Is it is it a case of uh, mini projects and, and building a portfolio, for example, because there are no exams? So as we speak, um, the, we are deciding on um, you know, the assessment criteria. Um, so we, we already have the assessment criteria. We're just looking at... Um, so before I get into that, I have to mention that this is, this is a program where we're going to cover a lot of interesting concepts. Um, we, we'll take you from the basics to intermediate, in some cases to advanced also. So it is essential that we carry the learners with us. Um, versus, uh, you know, the learners falling behind. So from that perspective, at least, this assessment is required. Now, how do we do the assessment? You are very right. Exams do not tell us anything. Um, so it is it is the actual practical application of these concepts that we will evaluate you. And there also, we don't want you to go with a prescribed set of steps. We would like to leave it open for you to take your own approach to the problem as well. So we are actually exploring that possibility as well. So the overall assessment is going to happen on these projects and mini projects. You will get individual feedback from our facilitators on how you approach the problem. Where did you go wrong? Where are those areas that you could focus a little more and do it differently? All of that feedback will be given to you. But along with it, um, we need to also ensure that you are on board with us so that will be a certain kind of grade um, that we will be looking into. More than anything else, this is not maybe a grade for the program. This is uh, more a grade to see that you have understood the concepts and hence when you move to the next topic, you are set for it. You are ready for it. From that perspective, we, we, we are looking at this assessment. And that produces... A really valuable and and demonstrable set of skills and evidence that employers are going to value as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank so you. Because, of the, oh, because of the facilitator also giving you feedback, now you know what you have done and what 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 you could have tried better. And now when you you present this to a prospective employer, you are able to go through it in several different directions. Right, you have, you you have your own solution, but then also the feedback from the facilitator would help you understand some of the um, uh, you know the nuances in which you should have uh, you should have considered this pro this problem, and hence the the directions that you could have taken. Exactly, exactly. Um, do you have to run, or are you happy to? No, I'm I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm wonderful. happy to stay. Fantastic. Here. Thank you. So. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview and there are some brilliant questions coming through. We're going to get to them as quick as, uh, as possible. I'm not going to touch on the things that we already have, but I will explain the structure, how it's delivered, time commitment and things like that initially, payment uh, fees and payment support that we can provide and application and entry criteria as well. But it is made up of, of, of four courses. Um, it is 100% online for those of you that are, aren't aware. Um, and as Chinook so, so uh, eloquently articulated earlier, the industry integration is a, a really key component of this, both in the design process, but also throughout the delivery of the, of the content as well. So course one, applying statistics and core data science techniques in business. Um, that is one thing that shone through when, when um, liaising um, and consulting with business on the design of the content Chinook was the business application of this. So that runs for six weeks and there's a week break in between. Course two, solving um, solving business problems with supervised learning. Again, six weeks and a week's break. <clears throat> course three is quite intensive. It's an eight week course uh, applying advanced data science techniques. And we've structured a week's break in, in the middle of that. Um, and then course four, exploring the future of data science, which I'm, I'm excited about, even though I'm not a, in any way, shape or form a data scientist, but I'm excited that learners will have the most up-to-date and relevant content to look at using tools that are, are so quickly evolving 
um, such as some of what you've gone through today, but also um, further AI and chat GPT like tools, because when we think about the evolution of that over the last 18 months, a lot of content that has been delivered is outdated very quickly. This is brand new content. This is the first time this course has been run, but even the content for that, that program will be fresh. Uh, as mentioned, your learning outcomes then enable your participation and application towards that industry project with either Bank of England, SAS, or Pure Gym as well. There's a commitment. There's a, you know, this is a seven month program that does require a commitment and potential sacrifice to accelerate one's career, hence the terminology. And that commitment is around 20 hours a week we anticipate. Some weeks will be less, some weeks might even be more when you've got some submission deadlines, but it is a commitment. It is designed more so to fit in with an individual than an individual fitting in with university in that you can do it around your work and other life commitments. Um, a, the majority of it is asynchronous. However, there's a great deal of support in both the um, Cambridge Ice Academic and Industry Facilitator hosting live sessions during the week. Um, and those live sessions are always recorded if one can't attend. But the majority is asynchronous, meaning that learners can choose when and how study is best for them. But that is a sacrifice, you know, 20 hours a week on top of a full-time job, for example, or um, or similar with other family commitments. We always encourage uh, the consultation with those that may be impacted over the short term, over seven months of your study and for the betterment of your family or your career advancement or whatever it is that you include them in that decision and, and explain why and and also understand the pride that they'll see in, in you studying with, with Cambridge ICE. Further support is offered in a numerous ways. There is a success manager that will guide you through anything you require to be successful from the course aspect, not the technical aspect, but the course aspect. And they'd be very proactive in their, I'll say customer support, learner support. Um, traditionally, you know, it's often a case with online learning where there's a lot of reactive support. Why didn't you hand your, your topic or assignment in on time? Um, the, the success managers are so passionate about servicing you, supporting you, and they'll even look at things like data and, and understand your study ha habits and patterns. And should you deviate from that, there'll, there'll be a proactive reach out, but you can meet with them very regularly via uh, video chat as well. La well. Not lastly, in terms of support, but peers support each other. We, we foster an environment in which that occurs organically as well with with the discussion boards and 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 the meetups and things like that the uh the virtual meetings of most value for all of our career accelerators previously um outside of the learning outcomes has been the addition of an executive style career coach you go through a rigorous goal setting process at the commencement of the program during the onboarding period um, and that guides the coach then or sorry that that enables the coach to guide you towards you achieving your intended career outcome much, much sooner. It's not just a resume writing exercise. This is someone that will dive deep into things like your values and set you up with tools and techniques guiding you through that process to succeed not only in your next role, but have confidence and tools to use those, um, that, that are those coaching techniques for any role that you apply for in the future as well. The coaching, we celebrate the, the career outcomes daily within 4th Rev and, and, and look forward to obviously celebrating learner career successes uh, following the completion or even during this program as many learners have a, that opportunity of being picked up there. Um, the program fees, including all of the coaching, so there's one-on-one -on -one coaching throughout the program and it is tailored if you choose to, to focus on the learning first and foremost, you can pick up the coaching towards the end when you may be, for example, uh, applying for roles and be guided through the the interview process. Um, so there's six coaching sessions that are available to you and even post completion, if that suits you better. For those of you that aren't aware, the cost of the program is 8,000 pounds, including that, and that includes everything. There's nothing more to purchase and, the, and that includes the career coaching, but we do want to support learners um, access the program as much as possible. So therefore offer interest and fee-free payment plans over either six or nine months. Or we do have a uh, partnership with EdAid for UK residents of a visa length of more than three years uh, and certainly UK citizens where you can apply to EdAid and de then defer payment over 24 months, again, with no fees or no interest as well. Um, we hope that that 
enables you to make a decision to invest in yourself, be that the spread out payment terms or the six or nine month terms. Um, and the best thing to do if you do have um, questions, you pop them in here, I'm here to answer them, but also book a time in the um, chat box with your enrollment advisor that's going to take a very empathetic approach to, to guiding you towards a decision. Um, I'm going to get some questions because there's some requirements regarding entry criteria and things like that. Um, we're only accepting 40 learners into this first iteration of this exciting new career accelerator. So in answer to the question, the first question regarding closing date for applications, we would anticipate that would be one week from the commencement date or um, if and when the 40 placements are exhausted. There are two additional uh, presentations of the program being run um, mid-year and towards in and in September. So if you miss out on this one, there will be future opportunities, but we certainly have placements available for the um, program commencing in March, uh, March the 18th. Um, entry requirements. Um, I'll get Chanook to help me with, with this in a moment to articulate in the way that you do, but entry requirements are a bachelor degree as a minimum with a quantitative unit of study included, be that mathematics, statistics, or those sorts of quantitative units. Um, and at least one year of uh, data aligned experience, and it could be in a, a, a role that uses data quite regularly. Lastly, we want learners to be able to hit the ground running rather than needing to learn Python, for example, at the commencement of program. And we can assist learners with some tools to get Python skills up to speed. But Chanuk, would you like to give a brief summation of, of the level of Python that, that, uh, that learners should have before commencing? Yeah, sure. So on the Python side of things, we're not looking for an advanced Python um, um, experience or uh, proficiency. We're looking for somewhere in the intermediate level. The reason being that, um, you know, this entire program, courses and assignments and projects and everything um, will be run off of Python code. And uh, uh, the, the basic Python commands and the constructs are something that we will not be explaining. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the, the more conceptual things that we have covered in the program, the technical uh, implementations of it, of course, we will be going into the details of it. But yeah, we will not be able to do the, because of the nature of how extensive this program is, we will not be uh, having the luxury of handholding you through every single Python command and, uh, um, you know, helping you understand it. So this is where we feel that if you could come in with intermediate level Python, and again, when I say Python, Python is a vast ocean out there, and uh, Python is used by software programmers as well. We are not looking for that level of proficiency. Whatever is required as a as a, for for a data scientist, so I would limit your uh, um, you know exposure and practice towards Python for data science. What are those uh, specific topics? There's there's a small list of uh, topics that would cover um, whatever you need for data science, and that's the extent to which we would need you to know. Nothing more than that. We're not asking you to come in as a Python software programmer. No, not at all. Exactly. Um, some other questions, and there's one here that I'll, I'll pose to you, Shanoop. Thank you kindly for sticking around as well. So just to conclude on the entry criteria, quantitative, quantitative unit of study at, at, at a minimum bachelor level, um, one is data-aligned experience in, in, a, in a professional field, and that's quite important because of the business application of, of the learning, understanding that business context and the value you provide in, in that regard and, and the Python um, skills that we just mentioned then, sorry. Um, lastly, uh, the application process. So there's a link again in the chat to, to apply. Uh, that would just require you uploading your documents, evidencing your um, undergraduate or postgraduate studies um, that meet the criteria. There is also the need to uh, up upload an identity document proving your identity and lastly there's a one page personal statement and again there'll be a link in the chat function the one page personal statement is quite an important piece of the application process uh, in that it enables us to learn a little bit more about you and your commitment your desires and hopeful outcomes as well and that enables 
your application to be assessed, aside from the self-evident things such as your academic background. What it also enables, once you're successful, though, is for your success manager and especially your career coach to read that document and, and, and for them to get an understanding as well of any empathy required in their support of you or just to get to a, a little bit of an understanding of, of where you're hoping this will take you in your career and, and their support of you in achieving that. Uh, it's an important part of the application process. It really only needs to be 500 words or a page um, and your enrolment advisor will then get back to you within 48 hours of the decision to admit, hopefully. Um, some questions, and I, I understand we're running out of time, but um, for those of you that are still here, thank you ever so kindly. I'm going to get through some of these quickly. Uh, Jerome has asked, thank you, Jerome, for your engagement too. Uh, is there scope to tailor projects towards problems faced by an existing employer? Shanu, um, on that, we're giving learners business case scenarios in which to work with at times, but it is very applicable to real world current um, practices and scenarios. Is there scope to tailor any of the in course, not the employer project, of course, we set that up academically, but is there an opportunity to tailor some of the um, learning outcomes and projects towards an existing employer? So uh, when you say existing employer, is there a uh, is there a specific employer that the learner is referring to or? I think that in the in Jerome's question, it would be um, during the the first four courses, with the with the projects that make up some of those um, deliverables, do we provide the um, scenarios in which they apply the learning to, or can Jerome in this case take an example from his employer's workplace and apply the learning to develop his project? I think the answer is no. We need to ensure it meets the academic. Um, yeah rigor and criteria um, however the skills are immediately transferable being so practical to one's in, in, in existing employer uh, and that's the whole benefit of it um well and also you see with with uh, anything and everything that is being done in this program has to go through a very stringent review and approval cycle with cambridge so uh, you know that that also needs to be considered yeah. Um, that's exactly right. So Jerome, great question. And um, and I can see the value in that. Um, but for those reasons, a lot of that is all the, all of that is provided to you. Um, a second part to that question, can you help us understand a bit more around the role of Cambridge versus Fourth Rev in terms of course content and assessment and the like? So we work in collaboration, um, in strong collaboration together, both on the design phase and also the delivery phase. Fourth Rev has been working now for a number of years, having developed the Career Accelerator model with other universities in King's College and LSE spe specifically. So this first new Career Accelerator with Cambridge is a true collaboration. So we often bring those industry partners along to understand um, the industry requirements, bridging that gap, but aligning the academic rigor that underpins the learning then, in this case, obviously from, from University of Cambridge I. So we work in great collaboration together to produce the most industry relevant content possible um, and most excited to be doing so. So it is uh, a true effort of collaboration in design um, and also assessment, but your final certification in the form of a certificate from Cambridge is issued by by Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education. In this case, the support is um, fourth rev derived support in the term in the form of the success manager and the career coach, as well as the industry based facilitator that will assist with the live sessions. And then there's the Cambridge academics also supporting you through the learning process and those live sessions as well. Um, Malia, thank thank you again, Jerome. Much appreciated. Malia has asked, as a beginner in this field, what do you recommend uh, should be a starting point? A great question. And, and I think, Malia, whilst this is um, designed for more of those looking to advance their existing careers, uh, some changes into data science as well. well. It's not designed so much for a career starter. I think you even attending a session like this is a great starting point because you're getting knowledge, you're, you're showing intent, 
and you've got stories to tell from from an event such as this. So the first thing you're all, always going to be asked is not so, not even so much your um, technical experience as much as it is always your, so what experience do you have? So my recommendation is always to reach out to those um, and, and attend events such as this, but find some way, shape or form to obtain some experience of the knowledge that you are gaining along any form of learning that you do. It sets you apart. So if someone's just doing the course, but you're doing an A course, and you're volunteering at a local non-government organisation or charity to look at ways in which they could implement data. That is so powerful when you're being interviewed by an employer, that little extra step. Also, uh, you know, there's, there's other things to take into consideration, but choose a course that's going to build your um, experience level as well as your technical capabilities and couple that with some volunteer experience, I think is a really, really great way of, of commencing. Uh, we've gone through the costs, um, someone's asked, and there is a certificate from, from, from Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education at the end. Um, and there's one last question here for, um, for you, I guess, Chinook. Um, I've, got a, I've got a line that I came up with the other day that might help with this, but um, how, how are we thinking about the role of Gen AI? Uh, and th are we thinking as a way of, for students to learn or break down concepts, use tools ch like ChatGPT to support with code scaffolding? What are your thoughts on that, Chinook? It will be certainly part of course four, um, but also during the program. Yes. So when it comes in uh, as part of course four, it's a different thing altogether. So there we are promoting uh, the use of it. While um, in the first three courses, um, well, I I will I will leave it to the learner to 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 decide on that because. Yes, you can use ChatGP to generate code, um, which 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 is in today's uh, uh, scenario, it's it's okay, I guess, because even when you go into a job, you are at liberty to do that. However, when things are not going well and the code is not giving you the expected output, what do you do? Do you still go back to ChatGPT and ask it to solve it for you? Is it able to do it? And if it is not, how do you step in? So using ChatGPT as a date from one data scientist to, to an aspiring one, I have no issues with it. Um, just like I have no problem if, if you're using Google to find code that will fit your particular problem. But if you have an understanding of it, it will take you a much longer way. Um, you know, it will, it will set you apart versus um, entirely relying on ChatGPT if it does not help you solve the problem and the, the problem is more complicated than, than you thought, then what do you do? You're, you're, you're staring um, you know, straight into the wall because you have no idea how this thing works. So I would say by all means, um, you know, um, use ChatGPT, but also have an understanding, put in that extra effort to, to be able to understand at least in certain areas what that chunk of code is supposed to be doing. And if it is not bringing out the expected result, can you at least do something about it? Yeah. Exactly. And we often get asked in discussions with enrollment advisors and so forth about this program and, and other programs that we do run about the impact of um, chat GPT on data scientists and data analysts and, and things like that is, are we, are we at threat? My answer is always no, because I'm old enough. You can tell by the color of my hair. I remember the introduction of Microsoft office. Now it's not as if Excel killed off accountants um, in a similar vein that chat GPT and other tools are certainly going to enhance productivity in many ways, shapes and forms but to harness that and, and to set yourself apart, exactly as you just said, is the opportunity. And we're going to provide that during the program with the most up-to-date uh, and relevant content available. I think I've covered everything. Is there any more questions um, from the audience that either myself or Shanoop can answer? If not, I'll finish up by saying, firstly, well done on deciding to attend this masterclass today. Uh, and I've had the opportunity, obviously, to answer some questions specific to the program. We are having more of these available to interested parties. I'd like to thank the members of the audience also um, that have committed and signed up to, to commence. We're almost, we're just over 50%
capacity for the first program, which is really, really exciting. There's a great deal of interest in that. Um, lastly, it's about making a decision as well. As I said, there are sacrifices to be made for the rapid development and advancement and acceleration of your career during this program. However, that's a good thing. Um, it is a life decision. So the very best thing that you can do is engage others around you about your life decision, if, if it's work or if it's your partner or if it's your family. Um, but the one thing that's going to also greatly assist you is a discussion with myself or with uh, your enrolment advisor. And again, in the chat functionality, there's the opportunity of doing so. But that's possibly the next step. It is a requirement of entry to, to meet with an enrolment advisor anyway. But ask them the questions. Ask me the questions. Uh, and we'll ask you questions about what, what it is that you currently do and what you're striving to achieve and tailor the conversation around that. It's not enrol now, enrol now, enrol now. It's this is what you're striving to achieve and here's some of the potential benefits that this program will offer. If they're in alignment, then great. Um, and we'll guide you through every step of the process thereafter as well. Um, so action time, it commences on the 18th of March. Uh, if you need to brush up on Python, again, reach out to your enrolment advisor. We do have some assets that will enable you to do that prior to commencing. And if you're not sure uh, about the technical um, background that you have, but have a little bit of Python, we do have a, a, a technical test that you can undertake as well. Um, good of you to attend today. We'd like to thank you all. Sorry for running over. It's not something I always do, but I think um, we've had some great engagement with the audience and the questions that have been posed. We look forward to welcoming... Well, sorry, before I say that, I'd like to thank you, Shanu, um, and also Sam, who sits in the background and, and helps us out. Thank you. You've been so in, um, edu you've educated me a great uh, about a great deal today, Shanu, but no doubt the audience as well, and we look forward to more of these sessions uh, and also the, the learner outcomes especially, but thank you once again. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that I got this opportunity to have this interaction. Good on you. Thank you. It's mo it's most valued by myself, but also the audience, no doubt. And then lastly, we do look forward to welcoming, supporting, but mostly celebrating your success either during or post the Career Accelerator, because that is exactly why we exist, is to celebrate career successes from learners going through the Career Accelerator. Have a great day. We look forward to seeing your appointments booked with Otto or myself, your enrolment advisors. Cheerio.